Well, Dr. Brady, I know you've been involved in many significant and fascinating projects, including our own aerospace program. But I would like to know a little bit more about uh, Joseph V. Brady. Can you tell us something about your personal and uh, academic background? Well, I'm a native New Yorker, and all of my early education um, was at the hands of the Jesuits, mm -hmm. which probably shows to some <laughs> extent. <laughs> Um, my undergraduate training was at Fordham University in New York, and um, after uh, we made the world safe for democracy back there in the early 40s, I uh, spent several years at a um, psychiatric hospital in Germany, um, um, where I was uh, quite... Uh, unqualified but served as the chief clinical psychologist of, really? the, of the European Command. That was on the basis of a um, an undergraduate degree in psychology and uh, someone in an um, introductory course holding up card five of the Rorschach and that made me the chief clinical psychologist of the European Command. But um, uh, I came back from Europe um, to the University of Chicago where I did my graduate training, but uh, with an interest in um, the possibility of bringing to the laboratory some of the kinds of problems I had seen at the clinical level in uh, psychiatry. And it was in fact one of those that brought me into contact with uh, behavior analysis and operant conditioning. Um, the uh, hospital I was at in the early 40s in Wiesbaden, Germany had a very favorite treatment. It was electroconvulsive shock. And um, this uh, was a remarkably effective treatment for certain kinds of disorders, what we used to call in those days at least reactive depressions. And the remarkable effects that would occur in a matter of a week with people who would, if you let them alone, they would normally recover perhaps in a month or two, but the electroconvulsive shock treatments were very effective. And when I got back to the University of Chicago, uh, after completing all the usual academic requirements and looking for a dissertation, I uh, tried to develop a procedure which would uh, make it possible to test the effects of that treatment in an animal model. And that animal model turned out to be the Estes Skinner uh, procedure, the paper that they published in 1942 on the mm -hmm. conditioned anxiety, essentially, I believe they called it. We called it the conditioned emotional response. And um, with that procedure, it was necessary for me to build a Skinner box and to learn how to train rats to press levers and to uh, then superimpose upon that lever-pressing performance a, uh, a clicking noise followed by a foot shock, and that's what produced the procedure, which we then eventually demonstrated was uh, cured with electroconvulsive shock. We learned how to uh, uh, give a uh, shock through the ears, uh, uh, a convulsive shock to rats, uh, um, 50 milliamps of current for two-tenths of a second produced a very standard uh, tonic-clonic convulsion. And the effects of a series of those was very selective. It just affected the suppression part of the performance without changing the lever pressing at all. And this particular finding, which occurred, I remember it well, it was 2 a.m. in the morning when I ran the animals after I had given them the treatment. Then my life was determined from that point on. It, there's no, nothing to, to match that kind of uh, effect that you see. All the animals did exactly the same thing, and the control animals retained their condition suppression. And then from there I came to uh, Walter Reed, where I spent 20 years, and um, into a neuropsychiatric research institute. And here again, the the issue was how do you apply 
the methodologies which we had at hand at the moment, behavior analysis methodologies, to um, the kinds of problem areas that uh, were to which a neuropsychiatry research operation was dedicated. And my little conditioned emotional response experiment was sort of my ticket of admission, is what it amounts to. Oh, uh, what do you feel was the main contribution of these animal studies, these animal <laughs> methods, to the you work with human subjects? Well, the main uh, contribution there was the ability to quantify uh, the kinds of effects mm -hmm. you saw and to, uh, and to look at the various parameters which had an influence on that. For example, the number of electroconvulsive shocks that were given, the temporal interval between those. We were able to define a whole set of relationships that would have been very difficult to do with humans for obviously obvious ethical reasons. Sure. But uh, the, the story of my life in this whole domain is one which testifies to the fact that behavior is every man's dependent variable. And it is no matter what came along in the succeeding years uh, to perturbate the, uh, the organism, the first question which everybody had was, how does this affect their behavior? And of course, that's the whole um, uh, drug area, which I'm sure John Boren uh, uh, elaborated for you is a classic example of that. Yeah. It's not <coughs> by any means the only one, but it was certainly a major one. The way I got into this was, of course, trying to parcel out what the critical variables were in producing the electroconvulsive shock effect. And we were trying to find a non-convulsive um, intervention that would have the same attenuating effect. And, of course, it turned out that the tranquilizing drugs were... Uh, that was the substitute. ...was the way that you could do this. And, of course, that got us into the whole area of developing procedures that would make it possible to screen for effective drugs that would have some use at the uh, clinical level. And of course, that's the, it was in the early 50s, right after I had arrived at Walter Reed, that the uh, tranquilizing drugs appeared. And the, uh, as I thought about it, what used to be, uh, or what had up until that time been regarded as unwanted side effects of drugs, you know, things that would make people kind of drowsy and out of it became the focus of medication development programs and um, a behavioral endpoint, essentially. And the need then arose for developing preclinical procedures. The pharmacologists already had thousands of compounds on their shelves, and the chemists could turn out thousands more from the bench, but they had no way of telling short of the clinic the extent whether or not these would be useful or not. And of course the animal um, behavioral procedures, predominantly operant conditioning procedures, turned out to be uh, the most effective way to do this. And of course, as you know, uh, virtually all of the large drug companies ended up with uh, one of our friends or relatives essentially <laughs> on their staff uh, to work with the pharmacologists. Uh, as I say, that was one area which has continued to be productive over the uh, many years. Uh, but everything else that came along uh, always ended up with, let's see, you've got, you guys have some behavioral procedures. Can you tell us something about this? Uh, it was, um, I guess, uh, during the 50s or maybe early 60s when our... Um, our embassy in Moscow, you may or may not remember that episode in which uh, somebody was beaming microwaves into the ambassador's office. Yes, I recall and, that incident. And <laughs> nobody really knew what they were doing uh, or what the purpose of that was, but uh, uh, I ended up in the embassy in Moscow <laughs> trying to figure out what it is we could measure, essentially. We ended up establishing a whole laboratory at Walter Reed that was dedicated to the um, 
the study of microwave behavioral effects on beha the behavioral effects of microwave radiation. It turns out that not much could be demonstrated um, uh, at at athermal levels. Obviously, if you get microwaves <laughs> up to the thermal <laughs> level, you can yeah, you demonstrate people, very yeah. big, you can cook <laughs> things, right? Yeah. But these were uh, very low powered uh, microwave uh, signals. And to this day, I don't think we have a very clear idea of why the Russians were doing this. But my uh, simple solution to that, after 10 years of research, <laughs> was uh, why don't we ask them? <laughs> <You're right. laughs> but nobody was in a mood to ask anybody then. I also learned a good deal about um, um, what are called um, diplomatic pouches under those circumstances. I used to think that a diplomatic pouch was something you put under your arm and went it like is not. What is a it? diplomatic pouch is anything that the embassy says uh, should be. We shipped huge crates of equipment. <laughs> into the embassy so that we could measure the signal that was being put in through the window. And they then sent the characteristics of that back to me at Walter Reed. We re reproduced it and studied the effects of exposing monkeys under various circumstances to that particular signal. So you're, um, that was a diplomatic pouch, these huge crates of material. That was a <laughs> diplomatic pouch, the huge crate of material, right. And, you know, from you, you can just go on. Uh, when it was discovered, for example, that animals would stimulate them themselves yeah, the through electrodes things. in the yeah. brain, the well, old thing, yeah. obviously uh, operant procedures were the most effective ways to uh, analyze that. Uh, one of the major problems which we approached at Walter Reed, for example, and was had to do with how to compare the reinforcing um, value or the reinforcing effects of stimulating different parts of the brain and asking animals, you know, which of these which locations like would like better. <laughs> well, uh, a uh, young man by the name of uh, Bill Hodos, who's still at the University of Maryland, uh, developed a procedure which has had great generalizability, the progressive ratio procedure, in which uh, you ask the animal to make uh, a response to get one stimulation, and then for the second one, he's got to make two, and then four, and then eight. In other words, you progressively increase the, uh, the cost mm -hmm. of, a, um, of a payoff until the animal, until the cost gets so high, the animal won't make the response will quit, we call a breaking point. Now using that procedure, Bill was able to demonstrate, uh, compare uh, brain stimulation in different areas of the brain and determine that certain the limbic system areas, for example, were much more reinforcing than, let's say, the cortex or other areas of the brain by simply comparing how much work the animal would do to get a stimulus there. Well, this turned out to be a great procedure, which I'm still using in the baboon lab back here to compare the reinforcing effects of drugs. We right. now uh, do work for the National Institute of Drug Abuse and for the Food and Drug Administration in which we can take a new compound and give it to the animals. Um, as you know, uh, that, in my view, and I'm sure John Boren reinforced this, the discovery that animals would self-administer drugs uh, using operant procedures was um, responsible for a decisive conceptual <coughs> shift in the way we look at drug abuse up until the, um, that demonstration, which incidentally was done sort of concurrently in our behavioral pharmacology labs at the University of Maryland in College Park. While I was at Walter Reed, I also had a joint appointment at the University of Maryland. And the uh, immediate past director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, Bob Schuster, uh, was my first graduate student out yeah. there. And he was the one that did the drug self-administration in the monkeys and published it in science and so on. Well, 
uh, the prevailing view of drug abuse until that, and alcohol abuse up until that time was, I think, most aptly expressed by um, W.C. Fields. You know, his <laughs> comments that uh, he made that it was a, a woman that drove me to drink and I never got a chance to thank her. <laughs> and this uh, reflected the view that uh, drug and alcohol abuse were really problems that you were driven to and that there were <coughs> antecedent conditions were the dominant factors. Well, the fact that animals would self-administer drugs made us think about that a little yes. more because you could hardly argue that it was the animal's mother-in-law that made them drink, you know, and the shift then from antecedents to consequences and, and bringing <coughs> the whole area of drug abuse into a framework that could be analyzed behaviorally in the same way that all other behavioral problems were analyzed, I think, was a very important contribution of the um, operant conditioning and the behavior analysis of that area. Um, so, you know, and as I say, every time something new came along, why, uh, the first question everybody asked was, how does it affect behavior? And of course, that was the the story with the space business as well, when it uh, became clear that the, the impetus to that, of course, was the um, <coughs> uh, dog flight uh, that the Russians uh, put up there in the late 50s. And um, the United States, of course, was not to be outdone by that. And uh, uh, we were approached at Walter Reed um, at the time by a um, uh, Werner von Braun, who was the uh, director yes. of our space <coughs> program. At that time, he had worked, he was working for the Army. There wasn't a space agency There was at no that NASA time. at that time. That's <coughs> right. It was the Army Ballistic Missile Agency in uh, uh, Alabama. And uh, he, of course, was the rocket expert that we had brought here from Germany after the war, um, and he had in mind to uh, uh, put, as he referred to it, one of my livestock <laughs> in the nose cone of one of his rockets. And this was a pretty far-right idea, but I said, well, I didn't know what that was all about, but we'd sure give it a try. And what we did, of course, he wanted, the, the main question to be answered interestingly, of course, was the, ex the effect of such a ride at 25,000 miles an hour into space. This was simply a ballistic flight. The animal went up. He was up in there for an hour or two, and then it came back into the uh, atmosphere again. Uh, what effect that would have on its behavior. So the idea was to find some performance that the animal would be able to do while in the course of this flight. And of course, we uh, chose an operant um, avoidance performance. We used the Sigmund avoidance, essentially. But uh, there's a lot of vibration in the nose cone of a rocket, so you can't just put a monkey in there and let them fly around. So the animal was put in a plaster cast so that he would be immobilized, and they left out one finger out of that plaster cast, and my job was to uh, to train that. Condition so that, that finger. To yes. condition that finger to make a response in order to keep a shock away that we had wired into his feet. The animal performed that beautifully, obviously, throughout the whole thing. And uh, the rationale, of course, was that if that performance didn't survive, then it was not very was not likely that anything more, sen you know, any sensitive procedure like working for food or so on would work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, that then gave rise to a whole series of studies, the, uh, the orbital studies with the chimpanzees. No, it was Abel and Baker? No, Abel and Baker were the first two. Oh, okay. Those were the ones that were in, in the, the nose cone okay. of, uh, and Ham was of the, uh, Ham was the uh, chimpanzee that we trained out at Alamogordo, New Mexico. And in that uh, instance, the procedure was uh, much more complicated. We had uh, him discriminating various stimuli and a matching to sample model and so on. 
And again, this was an orbital flight. The animal went up there and orbited the Earth four times, and during which time he performed all of these things in his... Uh, checking his, things out for John checking Glenn. Things out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he performed uh, fine throughout that. And uh, those were essentially the demonstration mm -hmm. that uh, it was probably a, a reasonably mm -hmm. safe risk mm -hmm to send a person under these circumstances. That ham, incidentally, um, died here about two years ago. I believe I read something about but, that. But yeah. uh, only after he was in the Washington Smithsonian mm -hmm. Zoo here, and then they farmed him out to some place in South Carolina for 20 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the evidence that we did not do him any great harm, um, I think, is pretty clear from that. And, uh, then it became a, um, a man program, of course. Uh, we had, uh, at the time, invested a fair amount in training a lot of chimpanzees because there was some, uh, the gentleman who ran the life sciences department of NASA was convinced, he was a veterinarian, mm -hmm. and he thought the space program was gonna be a chimpanzee program. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Needless to say, it was, quite clear in a short order that uh, it was not to be a chimpanzee program. Did you encounter any resistance in uh, your shifting these animal models, these methodo this methodology that you had been developed in the animal laboratory and that you had worked so much on, to the human case? In the, spa in the case of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the answer was that we absolutely were, it was impossible to mm -hmm. uh, intrude at all into mm -hmm. the human side of this with a, anything that looked like a performance uh, evaluation. Mm -hmm. And that has been true for the past uh, 25 years. Mm -hmm. It's now beginning to change. And the reason it was so, I think, is because the uh, folks who, who ran the program and who were essentially in charge were the astronauts themselves. Mm -hmm. These were all test pilots. They had already been tested. And any time you mentioned even briefly that you wanted to do some kind of an experiment which evaluated their performance, you were out of there. Yes. <laughs> there was no way that that was that. I don't think this had to do in any general way with extrapolation from humans, from animals to yeah. humans. Uh -huh. But we were able to do that in the laboratory. And what came out of that uh, whole technology, that is the development of methods mm -hmm. to study animals under conditions where they were in continuous flight, for example, was the notion of continuous, total and continuous environmental control, which turns out to be an extremely powerful way, for example, to make a difference. And I guess I don't have to tell you that once you've got that. And we were able to uh, get some support for a laboratory here at Johns Hopkins, which is uh, been operating for about 20 years now, in which we have been running humans in what we originally called a programmed environment, but which for uh, diplomatic reasons has, in later years has been called uh, confined micro-societies. Oh, all right. Uh, this laboratory started in the 1960s, and uh, you may or may not remember, but the notion of behavior control was not a popular one <laughs> in the 1960s. So we had uh, a great deal of difficulty uh, in this laboratory, you know, getting support for it, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Did you encounter any resistance on the part of the subjects themselves? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to arrange that environment uh, in, a, in a way that is adequate to maintain a biological, you know, has to be biologically adequate and behaviorally. And that was the challenge we had. But we've run, I'd say, several hundred subjects, usually in groups of two or three, um, and with a remarkably low attrition. Uh, perhaps in my recollection, two or three people have left an experiment before, and they were in there in this programmed environment for periods of um, 
two to three weeks at a time. Can you give me some examples of some of the experiments? The, what were the data that you collected under these Well, uh, uh, one of the kinds of things we looked at, for example, were the conditions under which uh, people would cooperate uh, or compete with one another. For example, uh, I guess one of the first experiments we did was um, to uh, program access to a social area. This was a, a laboratory that had individual rooms where the, pa where the subjects lived, but it also had a social area. But everything was under um, uh, program control. That is, all the doors had solenoid locks on them and all the cabinets where the supplies were and so on. So and they were always, access to that was provided only by a, uh, the program so that we could essentially control the extent to which uh, people went into the social area. And um, uh, we studied, for example, uh, uh, one of the more interesting practical um, uh, outcomes of this was a, um, an experiment in which during the first, these experiments, as I say, lasted often for weeks at a time. During the first uh, three or four day period, uh, the subjects were all allowed to go down into the uh, social area together. And during these socialization periods, what we, we had them all on TV screens, of course. We had a, uh, using a VI schedule, we simply took some measurements of the distance between the subjects. Um, uh, at, at intervals, you know, we should measure how far A was standing from B and B was standing from C and C was standing from A, you know, we got all these measures. And it was a VI tape and we did it on a random schedule so that we got a pretty good sample of just who, how far they stood away from one another and so on. Social distance. The social distance measure mm -hmm. by just simply quantifying, mm -hmm. the, putting a ruler on the TV mm -hmm. screen. Then um, we, um, uh, changed the rules. And during a second period, we, the rule was that two and only two subjects could go down into the social area together. And therefore, they had to essentially pair off. And it turns out that the distance measure during that early social period predicted very well who would be the pairs. In other words, the subjects that, the subject who was state away from them essentially was the outlier. Mm -hmm. And the other two, we could predict from those measures then who was likely to be the. And we did a whole series of experiments in which we substituted, uh, you know, crew member. We'd take one out and put a new one in. We did experiments with women and men combined and so on. Uh, all the things that we were convinced at least were the, the essential database that NASA is ultimately going to need. Uh, they are now, you know, we're now talking about interplanetary probes and uh, uh, trips to Mars that are going to take two to three years. We're going to put small groups of people into one of these, you know, like a shuttle, an area not much bigger than that, and send them off for a period of two to three years, six to eight people. Useful to know about their social distances. Boy, huh? yeah, and, how, and if uh, we're lucky, if they don't kill one another by the time they get there, much less be able to produce anything. So I think what we need is a basic mm -hmm. science, uh, a database here mm -hmm. for uh, for this kind of work. This was far ahead of its time. NASA, uh, they've just begun to, you know, they've, as a matter of fact, I had two people out here Monday visiting and said, oh, say, this is, I said, well, you know, the, the world wasn't ready for this when we were doing it uh, 10, 15 years ago. Now they say, well, things have changed in the National Arts and Space Administration. Uh, we have a lot more payload specialists now. The, the test pilot days, the type A test pilot day is not over because they still, but, but the, there are now a lot of physicians and scientists who are flying and these ex doing experiments themselves so that they are much more amenable to the kinds of studies which I think are absolutely essential. If, uh, the Russians uh, 
I'd been on an exchange program with the Russians. The one exchange program, incidentally, that survived all of you know the 20 or 30 years of the Cold War was the space program. Every two years, we would we'd send a troop over there, and they would come over here. And the last time they were here, a few years ago, I took them over to this human laboratory, which was called the Pavlov Laboratory. They, they thought this was pretty nice. <laughs> They're very familiar with programmed environments. But there, there must have been, I guess, five or six psychologists in this group. And the reason was that they recognized that this was the major limiting factor, as they saw it, for the long-term uh, exploration of space. That there were a lot of medical problems, you know, bone deterioration, decompensation of the cardiovascular system, all those things were getting a handle on. The behavioral problems. Don't have a good handle on the behavioral one yet. Small groups and confined micro societies for long periods of time. It's an empirical matter, in my view, and, and we could get a lot of the necessary data right here on Earth. But uh, well, tell me, um, going back to some of this, uh, uh, in these in the shifts from uh, animal research again to human applications, did you find any principles? Uh, from the animal laboratories that did not apply to the human case. Uh, did, uh, let me put it another way. Uh, did you make any mistakes or have any real problems when you went to the human condition because of well, the, misleading? Well, the, the major problem which we have continuously in, those, in that move in the extrapolation mm -hmm. is simply the level of control mm -hmm. which you have over all the variables. To the extent that we were able to exercise the kind of control we do in an animal laboratory and this programmed environment, uh, the translation was very straightforward. When you go into the natural ecology where you lose control of the kinds of yes. things that you think mm -hmm. that we know are important, it's, we do have problems. This does not, in my view, mean that we've made a mistake at the animal level. It just means that we don't have a good grip on all the things we all need to uh, Exactly. Well, going back uh, even a little farther, um, it, when you began all of this work, let's say when you were uh, in graduate school and in your early work, who would you say were the people uh, who influenced you the most? Well, uh, that the answer to that question is very easy. It was uh, Professor Howard Hunt at the University of Chicago who um, uh, actually uh, introduced me to the whole operant methodology. Was that Howard Francis Hunt from Minnesota? Uh, he was a, exactly, he was a roommate, he was Bill Estes roommate in uh, at Minnesota. Did you know Howard oh, Hunt? Oh yes, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, he was just an incredible... Uh, we were probably uh, Howard uh, and his wife-to-be at that time. and Ida. Uh, Ida Hunt. Right. And uh, uh, we were probably best friends there at Minnesota. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well now, I, I'll <laughs> bet you nobody has put Howard into this thing yet. Not yet, they? and I'm very glad well, to have boy, him there. I'm delighted to <laughs> be too. able to do that. Yes, sure. we thought the world of Howard. And uh, of course, he, it's interesting because he and I arrived at Chicago at about the same time. Yes. He was in the Navy uh, during the war and was out at Stanford, as mm -hmm. I recall. And he came, I think, in 1947, 1948. I, was, I came back from Germany to um, uh, the University of Chicago, and he came from Stanford to the University of Chicago as an assistant professor or something. And, um, you know, we were both sort of, and that was, we built the lab there together, essentially. Our status was a little different. He was on the faculty, and I was a, um, a graduate student. But our ages weren't that much different. And uh, he, uh, of course, um, was, uh, was the director of the clinical program, and that's why he was assigned as my mentor, because I had just spent three years in a psychiatric hospital in, as the chief clinical <laughs> psychologist of the European <laughs> Command. Some strange things happened during the war. That's exactly <laughs> that one right. probably and was not so strange. I think <laughs> both of us, however, and I did all my clinical training there. I did uh, spend a year with Carl Rogers, for example, and I learned how to out non-direct people. and. Uh, 
I took all the clinical Rorschach courses, of course, because that's what the Army had sent me there to do. And, uh, but Howard and I, I think, had our best times in the <laughs> laboratory where we were. Uh, they had a, 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 a I'm, not, I'm not sure the extent to which Howard was responsible for this, but he certainly, uh, they had an interesting requirement at Chicago. It may not have lasted more than the year or so that I was there, but um, uh, we uh, were required to take our preliminary examinations uh, nine months after we arrived. The first year, it was the first nine months. I remember I arrived in, I think, uh, September of 47, September of 48. And in June, uh, in May of the following year, we had to take our prelims, which covered the whole of psychology. And during that period, we had a core curriculum in which every one of the faculty came on for two weeks and told us everything you'd ever want to know about that area. I remember James Greer Miller, who was the chairman of the department, who was also a physician. Uh, we learned about the medical psychology from James Greer Miller, and his, the assigned text was Cecil's textbook of medicine. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen Cecil's, but in two weeks I read Cecil's textbook of medicine. I went back recently, I found it on my shelf. It's got all, you know what you do when you highlight things? I've gone through the whole season. I have all these highlight marks <laughs> while I mastered medicine in two weeks. <laughs> That's but great. in addition to meeting those academic requirements, we had to pick out an experiment from the literature and reproduce it in order to qualify for your prelims. And it was, I picked that S.D. Skinner study and to reproduce that during the nine months. And it was, that was the one that Howard essentially pointed me toward and helped. We built the box together and we did the whole thing. Howard had never done any animal work at all either. He had most of his, he, his yes, training was with Star Hathaway. In clinical, yes, at, right. In clinical. Yeah, at, at, right. And uh, I guess he got to Chicago and I had never done it. So the two of it was like the blind leading the blind. <laughs> we, we used to tease him about being a clinician. Uh, <laughs> well, he, he took that very seriously <laughs> yes. because he really aspired to be something more <laughs> in a basic way. And as a matter of fact, when um, we published the first paper on the electroconvulsive shock effect together, uh, he got a letter from um, I'm just trying to think. A, a reprint request from, uh, oh, come on, you know, the, the two the contemporaries at Minnesota for many years. Uh, they were, well, uh, well, they stayed there. Um, okay, I can't. The names uh, yeah. escape me at the moment. But, but what pleased okay. Howard most was uh, 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 this reprint request <laughs> from, um, uh, the name will come to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's still around. One of, them, mm -hmm. one of them died recently in California a couple of years ago. Oh, Bill Heron. William Heron? No. No. Uh, the no. successor to the William Heron was a Skinner he, contemporary. No, yes, these okay, two, no, this is somebody these later. These two were contemporaries of Estes and Hunt, and, uh, and they're still around. <laughs> Paul Meal? Paul Meal. Paul Meal, yes, okay. Right, okay. I went to high school and, with Paul Meal. All right, now Paul, when. when <laughs> Howard got a Kenneth McCorkadale and Ken McCorkadale. Right. Howard, we got a reprint request from <laughs> from uh, Paul Meal with a little note on the top that said, "Have a pellet." <laughs> and that was the that was the <laughs> that thing that, how, that pleased Howard more than anything <laughs> else. Because, and this was a st an animal study with mm -hmm. electroconvulsive, you know, the yeah, kinds of right. things that you you guys had been kidding him about, presumably. <laughs> right. But uh, I have no hesitation in answering that question. Mm -hmm. It was Howard Hunt that had the major influence on my uh, under my graduate career. And, uh, well, in a uh, corollary, which I think you've already answered, uh, what uh, publication would you, or book or article would you say influenced you most? Well, um, I, I guess after I, the, clearly that uh, Estes yes, and Skinner, Skinner uh, mm -hmm. had a major effect operational effect. I, I wasn't looking at it in the, in the highly, you know, conceptual sense, mm -hmm. uh, but I was looking for methodology and this, but, but subsequent to um, when I, after I left Chicago and arrived at Walter Reed, uh, 
um, and had the opportunity to do some recruiting. Um, uh, I, that's how I ended up with Mary Sidman and uh, a number of Dick Hernstein, a number of people at Walter Reed. We had a little help from General Hershey, of course, who was doing some recruiting for us at the time. But, but Murray we hired as a civilian. I was most influenced by a, pub, by a paper by Nat Schoenfeld uh, on anxiety, which he published in a book by Hoken, Hoken Zubin. And it was on, you know, experimental analysis. And that paper, I thought, was just superb. It was Nat Schoenfeld mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. I think had the most effect in terms of uh, influencing the kind of continuing experimental analysis I got involved in, in, in areas called emotional behavior or whatever. So I would say the um, S.D. Skinner paper first, and then the Nat Schoenfeld's paper on uh, anxiety in the Hogan Zubin volume. Well, uh, another point here, when you started out with your work, say your early days at Walter Reed or even earlier, what did you, you consider to be your main purpose or your objectives in your career? What did you hope to accomplish? Well, obviously, when I uh, went back to the University of Chicago, my goal was to uh, be, get some training in, uh, in clinical, so that I would continue in clinical psychology in some way. After I uh, had done a few experiments and published, while I was a graduate student, as a matter of fact, uh, it was perfectly clear that the thrill of uh, of an experiment was something that uh, I was never going to get rid of. That is, uh, uh, having designed an idea of how you want to answer some question and could could provide all the methodologies and technology you needed to do that. Um, I uh, I think my my main objectives and these you know it's hard to say this is what I saw myself mm -hmm. doing as. The years have passed, however. It's pretty clear to me that uh, uh, the a science of behavior that uh, comes out of a uh, laboratory, um, a set of laboratory experiments is um, really a, uh, a goal mm -hmm. that uh, is just going to pay off in all ways, you know, mm -hmm. anyway, in, in methodology and conceptual uh, effects, so on and so forth. So, As each successive application uh, became, <coughs> you know, important and necessary to do, the, uh, it, it became increasingly clear that what we needed was a sound base, uh, a science of behavior, essentially, that uh, would come from the same empirical bases that other sciences have come from. I understand that you've been awarded the 1992 Distinguished Scientific Award for Applications of Psychology. Applications of Psychology, and I fa I've just started, I haven't done much thinking about that because I've got too many other things to worry about. I've got to go to England here in a week or two to give a, a lecture at um, the European Behavioral Pharmacology Society, but I was thinking to myself uh, the other day, if what what kind of a theme is there to be developed here? And I, what, is, what does this all mean? You know, I was going to ask you what you were going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I haven't really figured that out yet, <laughs> but it'll be something akin to what we've been talking all about, right. I'm sure. But mm -hmm. um, uh, it, what, it, what occurred to me to think about how, how your life changes mm -hmm. as a function of these influences which you get involved in over the years. I, I thought back to those early days at Chicago when your, your life was focused. You knew exactly what you had to do every day when you came in. Your job was to get those animals run so you could get your dissertation finished and you knew, I mean, it was, that was it. And then as the years passed, you, you get more and more spread out into, oh, wait a minute, hey, there's something over there. And I, uh, until 40 or 50 years later, they give you a prize for having bitten off more than you can chew. 
And that's what I've regarded that this, that's this, what it's this, about. this award is all about. It's given to someone who bit <laughs> off more than they could chew. <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what I'm going to do next. The well, world is, a, it, there's just too many things going on at the same time. Well, out of all of these things, what would you consider your main accomplishment oh, today? Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, I, obviously, the, the, major, um, the major area in which I have dedicated myself more than others is in the area of behavioral pharmacology mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, development of laboratory methodologies for essentially evaluating, uh, assessing and evaluating drugs of abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I... Uh, uh, if we're getting near the end of this, I'm going to tell you what I'm near the end of right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because uh, the ultimate application uh, came about here about uh, two years ago when uh, I decided to uh, go from the laboratory where the problems of drug abuse are certainly analyzable and under some degree of control to a clinical level. And uh, because it seems to me that until we solve this problem of drug abuse, or at least make mm -hmm. some, some inroads into it, that the, the possibility of, uh, of improving the general health of the nation with respect to all these other side mm -hmm. things now, AIDS and uh, you know, the, educational the, the level. Educational or, level. There's just no way we can do that. This is an important one that we've mm -hmm. got to come mm -hmm. to grips with. Uh, by the same token, the the folks out there who are, uh, you know, who suffer the most from mm -hmm. this uh, have a, a peculiar attitude toward any interventions which mm -hmm. look like it might be helpful. For example, <laughs> Um, in the city of Baltimore, we have some 35,000 IV drug abusers. We have 5,000 treatment slots. Now, this doesn't mean that the other 30,000 are knocking down the doors to get mm -hmm. treated, but some proportion of them would be of the treat treatable if they were. There hasn't been a new drug abuse treatment clinic in the city of Baltimore in 15, 17 years. And the problem is the NIMBY problem. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> Everybody wants drug abuse treated, but not in their backyard. Mm -hmm. so all the drug abusers are in their backyard. But if you put a treatment clinic there, you're going to ruin the neighborhood or some, something like this. Is that. So I got this bright idea that maybe we could sell them on a mobile drug abuse treatment approach. And I... Uh, developed a proposal to the National Institute of Drug Abuse for a demonstration project. Um, now, it had to have sort of a research design to it, obviously, because the National Institute of Drug Abuse mm -hmm. only, they don't do treatment, they only mm -hmm. do research mm -hmm. in treatment and so on. And I harked back to uh, an experiment that I uh, had done at Walter Reed, a yoked control experiment with the ulcers and executive mm -hmm. monkeys some years back where the animal was mm -hmm. avoiding shocks, mm -hmm. but uh, the, he had a yoked control animal, so that every time, if he failed to do his work, then not only did he get a shock, but the control animal. Uh, the, the general idea mm -hmm. of yoking them together mm -hmm. was. So um, what I did was submit a proposal to uh, put a mobile treatment, uh, drug abuse treatment program on the streets of Baltimore and to use two neighborhood areas, essentially, that had comparable demographics and mm -hmm. had about the same drug abuse problem. And in one of them, I have a uh, van, a uh, medication van, which is essentially a uh, recreational vehicle that's been converted into a medication van, and a trailer where we do the counseling. The medication van, we do methadone treatment, which goes out and sits in the middle of this area for all day long, essentially, and we do the treatment. The other one on the other side of town uh, goes to a location for a couple of hours and then takes care of the people that are treated there and then moves on to the next area and we circulate between three or four different areas. Mm 
And after 18 months, we're going to switch. So this one's going to become mobile, and that one's going to become stable in the middle. The notion here is to see whether or not, well, we know already, I've been, now it took me a, a year and a half to get this thing going, because everybody, uh, you know, you have to start from the mayor and work on down. And, uh, and furthermore, this is put in the context of a mobile health service in which we do drug abuse treatment. It's not just a not just a research not project. just a, a research project, and and it's not just a drug abuse project to make it acceptable to the community. But you know, everyone thought this was a great idea. <laughs> when you get down to the people, they who are in their neighborhood, they say, oh, that's a great idea, why don't you park it over there? <laughs> they didn't want the bus to stop in their corner, you know, so. Finally, the solution to that problem, incidentally, was the clergy. When I finally got to the mm -hmm. clergy in the area, and we're parking our vehicles now in the churchyards and so on, great. and it yeah. works extremely well. We're yeah. doing good works, and, uh, and people don't argue so much with the reverend when he says this is part of the thing we have to do. In any event, uh, it, we have a um, very satisfactory, we've only been in business actually seeing patients for about six months now. But we have a remarkable, one of the major problems incidentally with these kinds of drug abuse, uh, methadone programs is that your dropout rate, um, within 30 to 60 days you've lost 40 to 50 percent of your patients. Uh, they have to come every day to get the drug or they go into withdrawal. And if you have to take two trolley cars and a bus, the behavior gets weak very fast, and particularly when there's someone on the corner who is more than willing to supply to you with you your, your needs. So uh, the notion of bringing the mountain to Mohammed has certainly uh, seems to be effective in that regard. Our attrition rate is somewhere around 10, 12 percent, which is well under half what the rest of the treatment programs are in the city of Baltimore. Um, the average attrition is between 40 and 50 percent in the city programs. In ours, it's around 10 percent, 10 to 12 percent. And what we're looking at, of course, is the extent to which we can uh, keep people in treatment. That's a major variable. And whether or not the one that's moving around is better than the one that's stable, and that's what the crossover design is about and so on. But this is really transfer, technology transfer, an right. attempt uh -huh. to bring what we know about drugs in a laboratory and, and ways of, like, for example, we do urine samples every week and we've found that a remarkably high number of our patients, uh, even though they're getting daily treatment, are using drugs in addition. For example, about 80% of them are taking cocaine because we're treating them for an opiate addiction mm -hmm. and they're also getting cocaine. Uh, there aren't any nice, clean mm -hmm. addicts anymore. You know, someone who's just on one drug, turns out everyone is on a, you know, poly drug abuse. So what's our plan? Well, okay, if, we've, if we know we've got them coming to get their methadone so they don't have to worry about their, to get their opiate, go into withdrawal, but they're still taking cocaine, and we, we can tell that we'll put a contingency on the, co on the methadone. In other mm -hmm. words, if you have a dirty urine, mm -hmm. in order to get your methadone, your urines have to be clean, for example, for mm -hmm. cocaine. Mm -hmm. And these are the kinds of behavioral manipulations which it seems to me we've learned from a laboratory, we know are effective. Mm -hmm. We're in a circumstance where we do have control of important variables mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. which is something we usually lack. We do have a good reinforcer for it. <coughs> and we'll be able to bring to bear some of the behavioral procedures that we know in an area where I now have a population. Now, I uh, don't know why I undertook this, to tell you the truth, because it has been a major headache. The uh, Drug Enforcement Agency was not delighted with this plan. Mm -hmm. When I told uh, we have a local DEA, you know, the guys who are supposed to be running down the cops and robbers, <laughs> he said, you're going to do what? <laughs> you know, bring the drugs out on the street on a drive? 
like a good human truck. I said, no, 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 no bell. So we just got that. <laughs> so uh, the applications of behavior analysis are not easy and smooth, no. I'm afraid. There's a, there's a heavy resistance out yeah. there for reasons that have never been clear to me, mm -hmm. but we'll keep making responses. <laughs> one of these days, one of them will pay off. <laughs> well, um, I can see how this is going to be an extremely significant contribution if it comes through, but prior to this one, let's say, what do you consider your most uh, significant contra uh, your most significant publication, let's say? Oh, God, I never think of those in that form. I guess um, the, the, uh, the Cambridge Center has just uh, published its first monograph, one of the first of its monograph series on um, programmed environments and the experimental analysis of human behavior. And I did the first monograph, and I have a copy of that in there. I'll be more than happy to give you. But oh, I, I love it. I, yeah. That summarizes all these studies we did in the, in the human, in the programmed environment, <laughs> applying essentially mm -hmm. all our animal laboratory technology to humans in a okay. circumstance where it was feasible to do so. I suppose that's, I think, you know, it isn't significant now, but one day some will go back and say, wow, these guys <laughs> did the, a lot of these things that uh, we would like to be able to do, in fact, are in there. And I suppose the participation in the space program, because that's what this is related to, um, uh, I guess the best news is that about three weeks ago I got a letter from the uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration uh, in response to a proposal I submitted years ago. Oh to do an experiment on uh, in flight, uh, a simple study of performance of the repeated acquisition. One of John Boren's procedures, I, pre I uh, proposed mm -hmm. that which turned out to be very sensitive for drug work and so on. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do this with astronauts mm -hmm. while, you know, before mm -hmm. the flight, during the flight, at different phases in the flight and so on. Of course, no. Yeah, three weeks ago I got a letter saying that they have, um, uh, uh, congratulations that my flight proposal has <laughs> been accepted and that I'm scheduled for launch on uh, SLS-3, which is a space lab, space <laughs> lab 3, which is scheduled to launch in early 1996. Well, great. So That's I'm so out of here. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness, yes, you and really are. They have accepted the uh, experiment, and, uh -huh. and they're ready to start the planning and so on. But we're actually going to get a chance to do some work with astronauts now. We will have access to them ahead of time. You know, it'll be probably a 16-day flight, something like that, uh -huh. during which we'll have them ahead of time to see. We'll, we'll get the schedule, and we'll be able to program repeated acquisition and a number of you know, digit symbol things that we know are sensitive mm -hmm. to various kinds of stressors and to drug changes. Well, that's very exciting. And we're going to do great. this in flight. Well, mm -hmm. on the 14th, uh, they were, as I told you, they were out here on Monday. On the 14th mm -hmm. of August is going to be space day at APA. They're going to have a whole day, they said, mm -hmm. of exhibits and people who are involved in the space program. So we're going to put up a poster or something on that occasion. And uh, it's, it conflicts with a few other things I've got to do on the, at the APA. But that seems to me to be the most exciting. You know, yes, I've been waiting indeed. 30 years to get on one of these flights. And That's wonderful. I'm going to go. That's very <laughs> exciting. I, they yeah. probably will let me go. But they'll let me put my experiment there some way or other anyway. Well, after all of this exciting uh, application, I was going to ask you, can you think of any ways in which behavioral science operant conditioning could be used in human affairs that is not now being used? But well, I see. My, I have written a couple of uh, uh, projective type things. Uh, the, the, one, the one dream I see out there in the future is the, uh, the space colony. The time will come when we will be colonizing space. What this will give us a chance to do, in my view, is start over. <laughs> and if we can bring to bear upon the organization, let's say, of a, a whole new colony, if we can do this 
with uh, bringing to bear the, the behavior science and technology that we have learned, I think this would be a grand. It's, this is sort of the the uh, the end point mm -hmm. of of the community, the experimental communities. Walled which, uh, into the in walled space. Into, <laughs> this would be walled into in space. Mm -hmm. But this is the ideal way to do it because you're unencumbered by all the rest of this. You have a chance to, to start from scratch under conditions where, you know, mm -hmm. all the resources will have to be made available for it and you won't have to be stuck in the middle of a desert someplace. <laughs> yeah. you know, mm -hmm. this would be so mm -hmm. that's my, I think that's the place where uh, if we keep developing our um, technology, our science and our technology, this is what I would see mm -hmm. as the ultimate application in a way to start over mm -hmm. again and avoid all mm -hmm. the mistakes we've made this time. Yes. That's it's not likely that I'm going to be around for that, but uh, well, you never know. I've you left might. it written <laughs> out. I, I'll give you some of these things and you can take a look and uh, yes. see what you think. Well, uh, going back uh, to the beginning, is if you could do things all over again, knowing what you know now, is there anything you would do differently? No. Okay. Good. You're, you're just, you, you know, we, we have this illusion that we are somehow <laughs> determining what we do. That's an illusion. We are all victims of our own past histories <laughs> to start with and <laughs> captives of the environment. Mm -hmm in which we find ourselves. And, you know, there's, uh, if that's a, uh, uh, you know, the, we are the beneficiary. I have felt, as Fred has said on occasion, I'm the beneficiary of a fortuitous environment. I just happen to be at the right place at the right <laughs> time, and when I get a chance to do something, I do it. So uh, it doesn't make much sense to say, would I do anything different? Of course, mm -hmm. there's some mm -hmm. things I do differently, but we don't want to put those on the table. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's bad enough as uh. it is. But, <laughs> right. Now, um. but as far as my, you know, professional career, the other thing is that I've always had great difficulty in separating my, my personal and professional life. They're always mm -hmm. sort of all intertwined with one another. And, uh, that brings me to another question, and that is, uh, do you use operant conditioning principles in your everyday life in terms well, of I don't, handling your family I don't, and your staff? I don't formalize them, mm -hmm. but I'm certainly well aware of the three-term contingency. <laughs> right. And as I tell yeah. my medical students here, if you don't take anything else away from my lecture but <laughs> that and look at any particular behavior segment or any behavioral interaction in which you're involved, in that context, you've got as good a grip, a good, as good a way to get an understanding of what's going on here as any other way that I know. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that I look at the occasions under which things are occurring and the performances and what the consequences are, of course I do. Uh, perhaps I can, I've, I've always found it to be, there's an advantage to looking at a uh, you know, a real life situation and doing a technical analysis of it in these terms. Um, this, uh, you know, you, you cannot be very popular doing this all the time, so you don't make a big deal. But the advantage of it is that it frequently calls attention to features of a, a real life situations that are not apparent when you talk about them in quotes pop psychology terms. But as soon as you impose a, some kind of a technical analysis on it, the uh, things pop up that you didn't think about or that you wouldn't normally, that wouldn't be called attention to. And that's the advantage I see in applying behavior analysis to my everyday life. It just makes it possible for me to see things that I would not otherwise attend to. I notice also that you have a w an award out there for being boss of the year. Perhaps that has yeah, something well, to do with it. <laughs> I don't run you a use very, positive contingency. Yeah, I don't run a very tight <laughs> ship. <laughs> I don't use aversive control. Oh, that, <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, one other, uh, you might say, question relating to your work with animals. Uh, have, did, have you had any problems with the animal rights movement? Oh, boy. <laughs> 
problem <laughs> with the animal rights movement. <laughs> How many more hours of <laughs> time do you have here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, bad question. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, this, the, I've been at the center of this mm -hmm. because I own the Silver Spring Monkeys. Oh, I'd forgotten. The Silver Spring Monkeys. Uh, you know, one other feature of my life which I haven't emphasized here, and that is about uh, 35 years ago I started a separate uh, the Institute for Behavioral Research with Fred Skinner on the board mm -hmm. and Fred Keller and mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. institute uh, has gone through many uh, mm -hmm. ups and downs. We, it's still alive and well. We're running nine group homes in the District of Columbia and five youth homes and mm -hmm. uh, you know, using essentially the training, uh, the parent training models mm -hmm. and so on. But it was the Institute for Behavioral Research that supported Ed Taub's work and, and the Silver Spring Monkeys were the Institute for Behavioral Research Monkeys. Mm -hmm. There is only one left, but he still belongs to IBR and he's in litigation in Louisiana even as we speak. The animal rights people are determined, uh, you know, they broke into the lab and they stole the animals and put them in a truck and drove them to Florida or someplace, and then when the judge and the law said, wait a minute, you got to give them back, they, they gave the monkeys back, but now they're claiming that they have a right to those monkeys because they became uh, bonded to them. <laughs> That's their case. They're bonded mm -hmm. to those monkeys because of that ride they took to Florida together. It's incredible. Yeah, but now, as incredible as it is, it's very credible because they've got money coming out their ears. They mm -hmm. put these atrocious pictures in the New York Times, take out a full page ad, which costs a lot of money, and put a little note down the bottom here saying, you know, <coughs> send money here, there. The, the income is mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of dollars a year, which they can then dedicate to wiping out biomedical research mm -hmm. or behavior, behavioral research particularly they are mm -hmm. because they know that's useless. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a little hard time with some of the biomedical mm -hmm. stuff where we're doing working with cancer, but they know that <laughs> studies with animals on behavior have nothing to do no, with humans. And <laughs> as any fool can plainly see that mm -hmm. this is silly <laughs> and it's a waste of money and so on. So. The answer as to whether I've had troubles with the animal <laughs> rights people, I'm their arch enemy. <laughs> All right. And uh, because That's I own the Silver Spring Monkeys, <laughs> yes. right? Uh, one other little technical question. Um, you've done quite a lot of work with groups of people now, and some social scientists claim that at the group level, new principles have to be introduced, that principles <laughs> established on the individual organism don't apply to groups, especially groups of people. Have you found well, anything it's, that can... Well, it's certainly not true, as mm -hmm. I've just indicated. Mm -hmm. We've done all sorts of, and this publication I'm going to give you demonstrates that yes. uh, uh, contingency is control that. is just as mm -hmm. effective with groups. Groups are made up of individuals. Exactly. Now, indeed, the complexity of the situation mm -hmm. is dramatically increased, mm -hmm. but the principles are the, uh, absolutely the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well, there's no, no credibility to that view at all. I mean, it's just very complex. Mm -hmm. But human behavior has always been complex. Even in, it, in its simplest form, it's very complex. Uh, in your uh, <coughs> many experiences, uh, whom do you feel you have influenced the most? Uh, who are the people that you feel you've students or colleagues or you have any outstanding Well, example? obviously Bob mm -hmm. Schuster, who is mm -hmm. the uh, director of the National mm -hmm. Institute of Drug Abuse. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess there are just lots of people around. Mm -hmm. I can't uh, make judgments about the extent to which yeah. I've influenced them. They'll mm -hmm. do, they can do that better than, than mm -hmm. I can, but uh, I just I know a lot of people I've made contact with mm -hmm. over the years. And they, I'm so. sure you've had many students. And I have mm -hmm. many students, but mm -hmm. uh, I never think much about influence. Mm -hmm. I say they, they too should be so lucky to be mm -hmm. the 
beneficiaries of a fortuitous environment. <laughs> and if I have been instrumental in providing that, Part of that right, environment. <laughs> that's all I need yeah. to know, right? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think for the uh, whole, what do you think the future holds for operant conditioning methods and behavior modification? Well, yeah, obviously it's, uh, we, uh, we will prevail <laughs> okay. because we're right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, what else can you say? You're optimistic <laughs> then. Of course. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, know, I mean, they keep making the mistakes. Eventually, they'll discover what the right way is to do things. That's <laughs> all. Well, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and your insights well, with us and uh, giving us the time. I it's hope been a pleasure be. and a privilege. Uh, okay. Oh, a couple of other quick questions. What is your definition of science? Um, I gave a, um, a lecture here some years ago when we uh, brought in a group of um, um, high school students from the local community. These were called the Christmas Lectures, and I was supposed to uh, address the topic of how scientists study behavior. You know, we're talking high school kids here who were pretty good, but they weren't really dedicated. So I had to make contact with that repertoire. And I told them that science was a club. Um, and it's a club that has um, certain rules, like many other clubs. Um, the first rule <laughs> is that the uh, subject uh, the the subject matter you have to study uh, has to be observable. Um, maybe not directly, but sometimes we have very good one to we don't observe heart rate directly. <coughs> we have very good one to one measures of heart rate, so we have an observable measure. The second rule is that the methods you use to make your observations have to be explicit, so much so that, uh, you know, they can. Uh, and the third rule <coughs> of the science club is that um, someone else, usually some other member of the club, has to be able to use the methods you've described and observe the same thing that you observed, uh, replicability. Uh, now, um, the science club uh, is different from a lot of other clubs because those rules are unique. There are a lot of other clubs that study the same subject matter, behavior. There's the art club, there's the music club, there's the religion club. They all have to do with behavior, but they have different rules. For example, you certainly wouldn't want a requirement on the religion club that uh, your subject had to be observable. That's <laughs> what it was you were looking at. But the, the, those three rules which define science, in my view, or define the science club, also are responsible for its unique accomplishments. Um, uh, it is uh, those rules which produce cumulative knowledge. And there are a few other clubs of the variety that I've just said that deal with behavior that have uh, can can say that to be the case. For example, the fact that we could ultimately put a spaceship on the moon is a testimony to the cumulative nature of knowledge. Each one of these little things builds upon the other until you're able to do, by systematically replicating, you're able to produce some very dramatic change. Um, that seems to me to be an important feature of the science club as it applies to human, uh, to behavior as well. Now, um, I asked the rhetorical question at the end of this lecture in prepa preparation for my going on to then show them some ex data and so on. Is now, what happens when you apply these rules to the study of behavior? And one of my colleagues in the back harked up, they throw you out of the club. <laughs> and generally that's true because usually you violated one of the rules. And the 
biggest rule that most psychologists violate is rule number one. <laughs> they do not deal with observables. And that, so in my view, this is a long answer to how I define science, but I define it as a club that has a certain set of rules. It's a, it's a set of behavioral practices. It's not something you know, kind of physical Mystical or abstract or at all. It's the way people behave. And in order to accomplish its unique goals, it has to follow these kind of rules. What impact has science had on your own life, would you say? Well, obviously, uh, I place a lot more credibility in things that are observable <laughs> <laughs> and relationships yeah. that I can see and things that I can replicate, uh, you know, when I can be very explicit about what I'm doing and the events that relate to things. So it had a very dramatic effect on the way I conduct my own life. So. What impact do you think science has had on the world at large? At different times, it obviously has very dramatic impacts. Um, my guess is that the behavior sciences probably had as little impact as any of the sciences. So simply, far. Sim mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. simply because of the preconceived notions that most people bring to this. And it's the same thing that I had a, knew a dietician once who said to me that everybody's an expert on uh, dietetics mm -hmm. because they eat. You know, they eat three meals a day. They know all about eating and what you should eat. It's the same way with behavior. Mm -hmm. Everybody's an expert on behavior. They're behaving all the time. We know what behavior is about. <laughs> and that's why we have so much pop psychology and so little science. Okay. And these are deeply ingrained notions that are not going to be turned around very easily. That's all. What about the man on the street? What do you think his notion of science is? It's pop psychology. At least as it refers to behavior. Behavioral oh, science. sure. Mm -hmm. He reads it in the magazine every day. He knows what, uh, mm -hmm. knows what it's all about. <laughs> what do you think we could do about that? What, uh, Just keep plugging away, <laughs> and building up a corpus of knowledge and making sure that it's documented and it's uh, in uh, archival form. That's all. Now, as I say, the best example I can give you is the one I've just had. I, we did all this work with uh, the experimental analysis of behavior for NASA 15 years ago. No one paid any attention to it. Now, all of a sudden, they say, wow, we've just discovered, ooh, this is just what we need to do now. Where, can you get this land? I said, where were you guys 10 years ago I, when I needed you, you know, before yeah. I, that whole lab, incidentally, has not been supported by NASA for 10 oh, years. Goodness it's now that. doing drug work because that's where, you know, we applied those same technology. That's the generalizability of, uh, of uh, you know, scientific advance is really the most impressive thing, that you can generalize it and apply the technology across the board. Right? And, but now they're discovering that all this stuff, is, which is in written form, and I'm going to give you some of that to go, we'll, uh, one of these days we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Well, thanks again.